we have been in the middle of a series called The Dog Days of Summer, where we've been looking at different Bible characters and how they handled uh, heated uh, situations. And today, the ladies get some love. All my ladies say, hey. hey. Today, we're talking about two ladies in Scripture, Mary and Martha. But gentlemen, don't worry, I'm not leaving you out, I promise. Go ahead, if you brought your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And as is custom around here, if we could stand for the reading of the word this morning. If you didn't bring your Bible, no big deal. We'll have a giant Bible up on the screen for you to follow along with us today. Now, I'll be reading out of the New King James Version this morning, or this afternoon now. So some context. Jesus has... Um, Jesus has three really close friends on this earth, right? Arguably his closest are Mary, Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. In fact, there's different portions of scripture where Jesus specifically calls out his love for them by name. Not many people can say that. Where we're at in Luke chapter 10 is Jesus is passing through with his disciples, and Martha and Mary get wind of the fact that he's passing through, and they invite him over to their place and here's where we pick up in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 and 42. It says, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted, someone say distracted, with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Sounds like a brother and sister fighting, right? Therefore, tell her to help me, Jesus. And here's Jesus' response in verse 41. He says, Martha, Martha, endearing, you are, not, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. I've entitled this message, you can have a seat. I've entitled our brief talk this morning, I just need some space. Have you ever felt like you just needed some space? You with me there? Let us pray. God, thank you for the moments now that we gather around your word. I pray that you would uh, bless us. I pray that we would leave not only challenged, but encouraged and refreshed today. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Well, we're in a series on summer, and uh, you know, the truth is we, we, we don't need another reminder that we are in the heart of summer right now, right? And so for us, we already know that. We were reminded every time we step out of the car or go outside, right? And, uh, and so for us, it's a time, summer is a time for us to get acclimated to a change in temperature, right? It's a time for us to do things like pools and beaches and water sports and things like that. Um, for those of us that are parents in the room, though, it's, it's also a time for us to help our, uh, our kids endure um, one of the most traumatic seasons of life for them in the summer, and it's, it's boredom. You know what I'm talking about? The parents in the room, you know, right? Boredom is like the worst thing a child can, can go through in life, right, to them in their little world, right? Boredom. And, um, you know, my... Um, my daughter came up to me recently, and she said that. She's like, I have a daughter, she's eight, and a son who's six. And my daughter comes up, Ella, she says, Dad, I'm bored. Dad, I'm bored. My first thought is, well, go clean your dirty room. Go read a book that I told you to read yesterday, right? But, but Dad, I'm bored. Let's go do something. Let's go, let's go do something. And I responded, and I think you'll relate to this. I was like, you know, Ella, I wish I was bored right now. In fact, I would pay good money to be bored right now. In fact, I did. I actually booked a vacation in October to do nothing. Like, I pay good money to go places and sit by a pool, sit on a boat, sit on a beach, and just veg out, right? Like, do nothing. Like, it's just life, you know? We, the older we get, the more we value that rest and that nothingness because we know we need it, right? And the truth is, the more that life goes on, the greater degree our responsibilities get and, and the busier life gets and the more stressful life becomes. Is that right? In our story today, Martha is, uh, she's stressing, right? She is, she is so consumed by her responsibilities. She's so focused that she is just, she's beside herself. She is stressed. She is worried. She's distracted, as, as Jesus says in, in the text. 
and she's worried about many things. You know, when I hear messages about Martha, typically Martha gets a bad rap because of the fact that she is so distracted, right? She's just so preoccupied with responsibilities and duties and household chores and taking care of little sister, you know, all the things. And she gets a bad rap because she's so focused on her responsibilities that she misses the fact that God is literally sitting in her living room and perhaps she should pay attention to him. She gets a bad rap for that. And I, I sympathize with Martha because I got to admit right up front, I'm Martha, right? Mary, her sister, her younger sister, on the other hand, typically gets all the praise because she is found putting the work aside and found sitting at the feet of Jesus, just hanging on to his every word, right? In fact, there's another portion of scripture where she is found pouring expensive oil on the feet of Jesus and wiping his feet with her hair, right? They both love Jesus. Martha's busy serving Jesus and and Mary just wants to be with Jesus. They both love him, but their approaches and their expressions of love are very, very, very different. So to draw a little contrast here and have a little fun with this, I want to talk about Mary and Martha for a minute and ask you, who do you most relate with, right? Are you Mary or are you Martha, right? In fact, on the way in, you should have received uh, with your City Church Weekly, uh, paper clip to the top of it, you should have received a, uh, a name tag that says, my name is. And what I want you to do is as I go through this list here in just a moment, I want you to think, who are you? Who do you most relate with? And write it down. Uh, dudes, if you're not comfortable writing Mary or Martha, um, you can write Mari for, for Mary, if you'd like. And, and Marty for Martha, okay, if you'd like. You can do, you can do that as well. But, but what I'd like everyone to do is pull this out, grab a pen if you need to get a pen. And as I go through this list, I want you to think about who you most identify with, right? Uh, Mary, Mary is is the contemplative type, right? She's loving, she's calm, she's relationship driven, she's what we would call type B personality, right? Uh, Martha, on the other hand, is uh, she's she's action oriented, she's the get it done type, right? She is busy. She's task-driven, uh, as we can see in the story, a little short-tempered, right? Some would say cranky, right? We would call her type A, type A personality. But who are you? Who are you? I'm definitely a Martha, so I wrote Martha on mine, so I would challenge you just to write that on there and slap that bad boy on, right, as we dive into this today. But who do you most identify with? Where are my Marthas in the room? Any Marthas brave enough to tell me who you are? Wow, a lot of Marthas in the third service. I expected that actually. Interesting, okay. <laughs> Where are my Marys at? Where are the Marys in the room? Okay, Mary. All right. Now listen, if you're a Mary in the room and you're married to a Martha, you get yelled at a lot, don't you? <laughs> Some laughs. Right, the truth is we know, man, and I'm, I'm, my wife was in second service and she's like, you know, shot and doing this in second service. Like, you know, this morning, you didn't, uh, you didn't get ready quick enough, Mar- Mary. You, 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 know, you didn't have the coffee ready like you said you did. Uh, you didn't take the shortest route to church. You didn't drive fast enough if Martha lets you drive, right? Yeah. If, it's a big if, right? You know, you didn't have the car cleaned out like you said you would. Things weren't in order. You know, those things matter to Martha, man. Those things matter. Meanwhile, Mary's like, don't sweat the small stuff, you know, like you're making a big deal out of nothing, right? Mary's known for saying the, the statement, um, don't sweat the small stuff, right? It's all small in Mary's world, right? Like nothing's big, you know, we're just, that's just, that's the difference between Mary and Martha. Uh, but the truth is that I know today, and I think you'll agree with this, is we live in a Martha-driven world, don't we? We live in a world, man, like our, our country is the most overworked country in the whole world. You know, we go on vacations, if we go on vacations, and we take our laptops with us, we're fielding calls, we're, we're checking emails, we're working on our days off, we're working on vacations, we're, we're so busy, 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 work, 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 right? I almost think that, that work has almost, or busyness has almost become a badge of honor in our society, hasn't it? Right? I got two quotes I want to share with you today from two books. The first one is uh, by a guy, a guy by the name of James Glick. He has a book titled Everything, The Acceleration of Just About Everything, right? And he says this, our ability to work fast and play fast gives us power and it thrills us. 
We always want faster, bigger, better, and it thrills us, right? Just, just who we are, right? Another, another uh, quote by another guy by the name of Lance Witt in his book, Replenish. He says, you can't live at warp speed without warping your soul. I, I just believe that is so true. We cannot live at warp speed without warping our soul. So what's the result of our busyness? I think like Martha, we're, we're worried. I think we're anxious. I think we're distracted. I think depression's at an all-time high. Anxiety is at an all-time high. We're stressed out, right? We, we see the effects of it because we're living and playing by the rules in a Martha-driven world, and we're paying the price for it. We are convinced that if we just keep you know, punching through our Martha to-do list, eventually we'll get to a point in time where we will complete everything on our list and we'll get to a point of rest. We'll get to the point of retirement. We'll get to the point where the work has been finished. But you and I both know the work's never finished. The list is forever getting longer. There's always something to do, somewhere to go. We are so busy and so preoccupied, distracted, stressed. I think we can relate with Martha in the text because... Um, She's stressed out. She is distracted. She is distracted to the point that though God is close, though God is literally sitting in her living room, he's far from her heart. Though God might be sitting, metaphorically speaking, in our living room, I believe for a lot of us, because we're so busy, he is far from our heart. We're in worship services like this, singing the songs, and we're talking about God, thanking God, encouraging you, praying for needs. Meanwhile, you know, I know that our minds are just, we're, we're distracted. We're prone to wander. We're thinking about lunch. We're thinking about the rest of the day. We're thinking about plans. We're just so unsettled. Our, our souls are unsettled. We're going, 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 and we're paying the price for it. I got to admit, I'm a Martha. Right? I'm, I'm not, you know, I know this is kind of a, kind of a tough word, right? It's, it's a reality check for a lot of us. It was for me just even preparing this, but, but I'm a Martha, man. I, I, I work full time, right? I, I'm trying to do well in my, in my career, trying to grow. I'm thinking ahead, trying to plan for the future. I'm, uh, I'm, in, I'm currently in grad school. I'm getting my master's degree right now. Um, I'm married. That's important. Um, I have two kids. My son loves to play baseball. I help coach his baseball team. My daughter loves gymnastics. Life is full. You, you could get up here and give me your list, and we'd all say the same thing. I mean, there, life, is, life for all of us is just, it's, it's busy. And the problem is I'm a Martha. I like things in order. I like things clean. I like my cars clean. I like my house clean. I, I don't like to have my plans interrupted, right? And so we drive ourselves crazy, and we drive everyone around us crazy. Us Marthas, we need help, man. And all the Marys said, this is the greatest sermon in the world. It's amazing. You know, one of the things that me and my wife have been, been able to do um, for the last nine years um, is we've been fortunate enough. I am blessed with amazing in-laws. Um, literally, I'm not even joking, for the last nine years uh, that we've been married, my in-laws have taken my son and daughter, as long as they've been alive, uh, to spend the night at their house every single Friday night. I don't know. It's pretty awesome, right? Yeah, they were, they were here in second service, man. I just, I'm so grateful for them. You know, that's, that's a huge sacrifice. But what that's allowed is that al that's allowed me, me and Liana to, to prioritize marriage and to be able to go out on a date night every Friday night. And I realize not everyone can do that. Um, but what I've noticed is my tendencies as Martha is sometimes I can get to the dinner table of wherever we're going or whatever we're doing and my time with her can become a spillover of a busy, busy, stressful week at work. Or a busy, stressful day can just become a spillover of the day. And, 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 and we, you know, it becomes more about our shared responsibilities in the home and in work and with the kids. And, and before we know it, we're not connecting. You know, even though we're at the same dinner table, sharing the same meal, having conversation, we're there physically, but mentally we're distracted. We're checked out. I think we're, it's safe to say, I think we would all in the room agree that we, we need some space. Do you agree? I think we need some space. So how do we create healthy margin 
in our life. I want to give us a few practical tips because I'm Martha. So you got to deal with my Martha-ness, okay? I'm going to give you some practical steps. I got a to-do list to get through here, so bear with me, okay? Um, but uh, the first thing that we must do if we're going to create healthy margin in our life is put first things first. We must put first things first. Stephen Covey wrote a book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This concept is in that book, but I think it's so powerful, such a lesson for us today. We must learn to put first things first. Check out this verse that we already read. I just want to highlight something. Luke 10, verse 41. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. One thing is needed. Notice Jesus wasn't necessarily rebuking her or correcting her because she didn't do a good enough job at juggling all the demands of life, keeping everything up in the air successfully and completing everything that she had to do. He didn't say that was the issue. He said, no, no, you have a priority problem. The issue isn't balance. Balance is, it's elusive, right? Like there's no way to balance. Like, you know, when you look at time management and everything we try and do and fit into our schedule, sometimes there's just... There's just, you need to understand where to to draw the line, and sometimes no is necessary. Sometimes elimination is the only solution, right? Jesus is saying, listen, you've got a priority problem because what's most important in the moment is not that you're in the kitchen preparing for me, but that you recognize that I'm here. You need to be with me. And in this moment, that's what's most important. But because it wasn't prioritized, The urgency of the moment became what was most important in Martha's world. And I think the same is true for us. Because what I know is that if we don't prioritize what's most important, what's urgent will become what's most important every single time. And what I also know and what I think you would agree is there is no shortage of Martha moments in this life. There will always be something more to do, something more to accomplish, We must learn to prioritize first things first. I have a little illustration I want to do that will help, I think, really um, connect the dots for us, right, and really illustrate this well. So what I have is a uh, plastic uh, fishbowl. This fishbowl represents our life. It represents my life and your life, right? And the the, the top of this fishbowl represents our capacity, right, the limitations of our life. We only have so much energy. You know this. We only have so much time. We only have so much that we can fit into our life. Do you agree? So this represents our life. What I also have with me is some rocks. I've got some gravel. Uh, The gravel, the small rocks, um, represents the uh, uh, everything in our life, the urgent things. Everything, the, the things that seem to fill up our life but are not the most important things in our life, right? And then I have here big rocks, and the big rocks represent uh, the things that are most important in our life, right? What I've noticed about life is it has a way of nonstop almost, right? Nonstop. It has a way of filling up our life with urgent things, less important things. Before we know it, we're, we're... Working through our day, working through our week, working through our month, working one year to the next. And before we know it, our life is full of things that are really not that important. But in the moment, they were urgent. Meanwhile, we've got some important things in life that we never predetermined and prioritized as the more important things. And what we try and do is we try and fit them in. And maybe we'll get one in. Maybe two. If I find a small enough rock in here, maybe two. But three, threes, that's not going in there. Right? We can, and what happens is we fill our life to a point where we're not able to make enough space for the things that matter most in our life. What we should do is reprioritize. I think you know where I'm going with this. I'm going to pour this back into this bucket. What we should do is reprioritize our life in such a way where we consider the most important things in life and we place those things in first. God, a relationship with family, 
our health, relationship with our spouse, our kids, whatever, whatever, whatever needs to be on there for you. We put those things in first. And then we fill the rest of the space with the other stuff in our life. And what I know is that if we do that, if we do this, there will always be some small rocks that we will not have enough space to fill our, our bowl with. There will always be things that we have to say no to. But they're not the most important things. Here's what I know. Saying yes to the things that are most important in our life helps us say no to the things that are less important. It's not that the things you're saying no to aren't important. They might be important things, but they're not what's most important. Thinking through Martha in this situation, right, just, you know, just she, she gets wind of the fact Jesus is showing up unannounced. I didn't plan for this. I didn't have time to go to the store. I didn't have time to clean the linens. I didn't have time to do anything, but I'm scrambling. I'm making it happen. He's coming. I got to prepare a meal. I got to go to the store. I got to clean the house. I got to make sure the sheets are clean for him, you know, because God's coming over, you know, like it's a big deal. And, 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 and she's working, 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 and she's so distracted. You know what I think would have been an appropriate response maybe if Martha had prioritized that time with Jesus was one of the most important things in her life. Maybe she could have, like, grabbed some Chick-fil-A or something, you know, like, <laughs> you know, Jesus, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't know you were coming um, till, till yesterday or today, and, um, you know, I'm not going to have time to make you this awesome dinner like I would love to, you know, like I've done before, um, but, but I got this. This is pretty awesome. You know, this chicken's pretty good. Just try it, um, but, I'm, but I'm here. And, and I know that's what matters most, Jesus, and I'm here. And what we have to understand is sometimes, man, unless we decide and predetermine this is what's most important, I'm drawing the line right here, it helps you determine what to say no to. Right? Here's what I know about me and you. Oftentimes, we wait to focus on the, the, the true priorities, most important things in our life until there's a problem. When do we most focus on our health? Doctor gives a bad report. We're forced to focus on our health. When do we most desire growing in God, a deeper relationship with God, when we're going through something? We're, we're at our wit's end. We can't, you know, we're just, we're done. We, God, I need you. You know, that's when we pray the most. When do we most spend, invest in relationships when there's issues? Right? We realize we've got to fix some things. And, and isn't that true of us? Right? And so my question to you today, church, is what do you need to prioritize? What do we need to prioritize? I had to ask myself this, preparing for this, because I'm such a Martha. What, what do I need to prioritize in my life? Second action for creating healthy margin in our life is uh, planning for rest. Planning for rest. One thing I know about a lack of rest is that it distorts our reality. Right? You try not sleeping for a day or two, what's your judgment like? What's your decision making like? What's your rationalization like? I mean, you just, you're, you're, you can't do it, right? You're just physically, impo it's physically impossible, right? The same result is yielded when, when you live a life and you don't learn to rest properly. I want, to I want you to check out this verse in Luke chapter 10, verse 40 and 41, going back to the verse that we already read. It says, but Martha was so distracted with much serving, as we've already talked about, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. She is criticizing her sister for not helping her, and she's criticizing Jesus, God, for not controlling the situation in her head the way that it should go. How often in our life do we criticize other people and even criticize God for not intervening on our behalf for things that are a result of a lack of rest in our life? What Jesus was telling Martha here is, Martha, you need to, you need to slow down. You need to slow down. Rest seems counterintuitive in a Martha world, though, doesn't it? 
You know, everything is based on control. You know, take control of your future, your life, do more, accomplish more. But the truth is a restless soul is a soul that thinks it's in control and needs to do everything. You restless today? Take a look at this verse, Psalm 127, verse 1 and 2. Love this verse. I think you'll love it too. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early, stay up late, toiling for food to eat. My favorite part, for he grants rest or sleep to those he loves. Come on, that's an amen verse. Maybe, maybe one of the most spiritual things you can do today is take a nap. Maybe one of the most spiritual things you can do today is cancel your anxious plans and preparations for that busy meeting you have this coming week. Go out to lunch with a friend, enjoy a meal, have fun, laugh, enjoy life, and consider the goodness of God. You didn't know that taking a nap was so spiritual, did you? So if we're going to rest, how do we plan for rest? I got a couple um, very practical tips for planning for rest. Some of them you might have already heard. I think you'll be surprised by at least one of them. Um, but the first thing, if we're going to plan to be plan to rest, which is something we have to prioritize in our life, right? Uh, if we're going to plan for rest, the first thing that we are going to need to do is learn how to take a day off. Take a day off. Off. And I already know, you're already sitting there like, oh, here we go. You know, you're, already, you're thinking about work, you're like, here we go, another message on, on taking a day off. And you guys know that this is in the Bible, right? Taking a day off is another word for Sabbath, right? You know about, you know the Sabbath, you've heard about what the Sabbath is. But just to be clear so that we're all on the same page, I want to be clear about it. A Sabbath is really three things in Scripture from what we can see. It's mainly resting from work. So whatever your job is, whatever your work is, you don't do it on this day. You connect with God and you connect with people. So we rest from work, everyone say work, we connect with God, everyone say God, and we connect with people, everyone say people. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, taking a Sabbath actually made God's top 10 list, right? Before, way before ESPN had a top 10, God had a top 10, right? We know that, 10 commandments. And uh, in his top 10, the fourth of 10 commandments was to take a Sabbath. Right, to take a day of rest. And I don't know if you know this, but actually uh, taking a Sabbath was one of three uh, commandments where if you violated it, the punishment was actually death. It was one of three penalties, one of three violations. The other two were first, adultery, if you were found committing adultery. The second one is disobeying parents. And the third one is taking a Sabbath. Right, so the next time your children are disobedient, you can tell them, well, sucker, you would have been dead in the Old, te Old Testament and you'd be right. Not good, not good, right? But, but, but man, when I, when, I, when I read the text, I mean, you can actually look in the Bible in the Old Testament, people were literally killed because they didn't take a Sabbath. They didn't take a day off to rest, literally. And when I first read that, I'm like, man, God, that seems like such a drastic repercussion for something like taking rest and doing nothing. Like, I don't know if, it, if, if, you're, if you're thinking like that as well. And I think the point of it is that you know, God takes it seriously because he takes us seriously. We need a day of rest. Might we be under a death sentence, killing ourselves slowly because of our refusal to accept God's gift of rest and take a day off? Wow. I heard a story of a pastor recently um, where he was meeting with another pastor and they were trying to get together to form a lunch meeting. And... Uh, you know, they got together, they got their calendars open, and one pastor looks at the other pastor and he goes, hey, so, okay, so what's your Thursday look like? And the other pastor responds with, uh, uh, well, I've got nothing going on Thursday. The other pastor says, okay, great. Well, let's get that in there. How about Thursday lunch? Sound good? He's like, no, I can't do Thursday. He's like, I have uh, nothing planned Thursday because Thursday I plan to do nothing. He's like, oh, Okay. He's like, the truth is, Pastor, what you don't know is I was in the hospital recently and I almost died. You know, I was just going full tilt, 110 miles an hour, didn't rest, and, and I, I, my, my health started to take a toll. And I wound up in the hospital and he's like, and I started to feel sorry myself 
for myself in the hospital bed. And I started to question God. God, why is this happening to me? Like, like I'm a faithful servant. I lead your people faithfully. I help people. I love people. I pastor people. You know, I'm, 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 I'm working. I'm a hard worker. I'm doing all this. And he just felt God speak to his spirit. And he said, you know, because you haven't accepted my gift of rest, you're not God, buddy. I am. That pastor decided from that day forward, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a Sabbath because I absolutely need, need a Sabbath. It's interesting, um, when God created the earth in Genesis 2, right, uh, he created the earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. We know that, right? Why? It wasn't, was it because God was tired that he needed to rest on day seven? No, no, no. He rested on the seventh day because the work was complete. It was complete. He did all he had to do in the six days, all he wanted to do in six days, and he did it as an example for us. If we're trying to do too much work and our days are so full, we're packing so much in that we're not able to accomplish and prioritize the important things in life, we're not able to get done the work that we're trying to do in six days, and we're having to work seven days a week, we're doing too much. Might we be killing ourselves, church? And God wants us to take a day off. And I would make the point that you will get more accomplished, especially if you look at your life big picture. When you get to the end of your days, I promise you, you will get more accomplished in your life. You will be more fulfilled by grinding six days a week and taking one day of rest and working seven days a week and not resting at all. I guarantee it. So my question to you, it's a question I've been asking myself the last two weeks, is are you planning for your rest? Are you planning rest? Is rest a priority for you? Are you taking a day off? The second, the second way to plan for your rest um, is something you may have not have heard before, but plan your nights. Planning our nights for rest is actually really important. Uh, in John chapter 11, Jesus hears about Lazarus being sick. Everyone knows the story of Lazarus. God raised him from the dead. Well, coincidentally, Lazarus, Lazarus is actually the brother of Martha and Mary, who we're talking about today in our text, right? Lazar, or Jesus gets wind of the fact, he hears about the fact that Lazarus is sick, he's not doing well, he's dead. So Jesus tells his boys, he tells his disciples, okay, guys, look, it's time for us to go. We gotta go, I gotta wake him up. He's sleeping right now, but I gotta wake him up. I gotta make him well. And his disciples look back at him and they say, Jesus, they, they tried to stone you last time you were there. Like, why would we go back there? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like, why do we have to go? And then Jesus kind of gives this off-the-wall response. And I want to read this today in John chapter 9, verse 9 and John chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. Most Bible scholars and people that study this text and are a whole lot smarter than me believe that the key principle in this text is that a man must finish his work in a day, for when the day ends, your work ends. We got to think about culture for a minute, right? When Jesus said this, there was no electricity. There weren't lights, there was no communication, there weren't mobile devices, uh, there was no transportation. So literally, when, when the day was over, when the sun goes down, you're, you're done. You go home, you light a fire, you throw a log on the fire, and you begin to wind down, spend time with your wife, family, you, you rest. Contrast that with our culture. We get home, we keep working, right, we're... Uh, you know, we continue working after we get home and we're, so, we're, we're checking emails, we're, we're taking phone calls and, you know, we kind of speed through dinner. We don't really engage in conversation with family at dinner. If we even eat dinner together, it's just kind of like we just get through it and we're so distracted. We're so preoccupied with all the little urgent things in life because we haven't determined what was most important. And we're just going, 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 work, 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 work. We finally get to the end of our night where we, we, we crash, we get in bed, and we try to throw in a merry moment in the end. And it doesn't work. 
We're frustrated. We're not spending time with God. Our family is suffering. Our health is suffering. You know, something, something's got to give, right? We wake up again. Our alarm goes off. The adrenaline pumps. We're caffeinated. We're go, 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 repeat. Where's the margin in that? Where's the margin in that? We not only got to take a day off, church, but we got to learn to prioritize our nights. We got to prioritize our, we're, we're good at prioritizing our days, filling it up, getting stuff done, but we got to plan for rest at night. Be with your family. Prioritize meals. Spend time with friends. Spend time with your wife. Snuggle with your kids. Read, study, pray. Enjoy, relax, rest. And here's another one, sleep. so good we need to prioritize our evenings so in closing I want to share um, something I think Mary had it right Mary the one kind of she hit the pause button on just the duties the responsibilities Jesus comes over you know what that's all secondary Jesus is here This this is primary this is most important she kneels at his feet just she's there and I think she understood something that we we I I feel led to remind you today that I think you might know but it's important for us to be reminded of the fact that Jesus is most important and Jesus prioritizes your presence far more than he prioritizes your performance I think part of the reason that we don't prioritize God in our life is, is because we subconsciously think that he, wrongfully, that he prioritizes our performance way more than our presence. In order to come to God, we've got to have everything figured out. We've got to have all the, the T's crossed, the I's dotted. We've got to have our life in order. We've got to get things straight. And I think we're mistaken. I love to take my daughter on dates. I try to do it as often as I can. Um, it's a goal of mine to do it once a month. And what I love most about that time with her is that there's no agenda. She doesn't feel any sort of pressure to come to dad in a particular way, say things in the right way. You know, one of the things I love most is when she's comfortable just spilling her heart out to me. What I love most is that we're just, we're there, we're together. I don't care what she wants to talk about. I don't care what we end up talking about. What's most important to me is that she's with dad. She's with dad. Might I just remind you of something? I feel compelled to remind you this morning. Maybe, maybe God misses you. Maybe God just misses you. I'm not saying work is bad. I'm not, I'm not condoning laziness. I'm not doing that in any way. We need to work. We need to get things done there comes a point where we got to decide and prioritize what is most important in our life. We're drawing the line today. We're drawing the line, you know, this is what I'm prioritizing. This is what's most important. God, I'm prioritizing rest. God, I'm prioritizing family. God, I'm prioritizing my health. God, I know I should have been doing this a long time ago, but today's the day I'm drawing the line. It might mean that I have to say no to some good things, but this is what's most important. Let me also remind you today, too, that that your ultimate source of rest and peace comes from Jesus. Let me share this verse with you in closing. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I think it's safe to say we could all use a moment with no plan, no agenda, nowhere to go, nowhere to be. Don't go Martha on me just for another moment here. Don't plan your exit. Start putting things away, making lunch plans. That'll come. But I've asked the band to come out. If the band could come out, and I just want to sing one more song, nothing crazy. I'm not going to ask you to do anything crazy. I just want to give you a moment. I think it'd be remiss of me to not provide a moment for us to just be with God, enjoy his presence, worship him, you know, and, and, and come as you are and, 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 and be free and, and allow him to give you rest.
for your soul. Can I pray for you today? Can we stand together across the room? God, I thank you that uh, you're the giver of life. You are in control. God, I need that reminder sometimes. I need it today. My friends, we need that today. You are in control. God, we might be stressed and worried and and full of, of anxious thoughts and plans and preparations and all the things we have going on in life, but we prioritize this moment because we prioritize you. Father, we worship you. We thank you, God. And we pray that you would come and grace us. Grace us with rest. Grace us with rest for our souls. Father, forgive us for not prioritizing the important things. Forgive us for being forgetful and not making disciplined decisions in what matters most in life. Would you heal the broken areas, restore what seems lost, and grant us peace, grant us rest in your presence this morning, this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you sing with us as we leave this morning?